getting there, Psalm 56. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Here in Psalm 56, I was just kind of flipping through the different psalms, and, uh, and this one caught my eye last night. Um, it's interesting right away that uh, David addresses God and asks for mercy to be upon us. Himself specifically. Mercy, O oh God. Now mercy is the withholding of judgment, of, of rebuke, of correction, of, of all these things that are actually deserved. Okay? So, so God should judge us. He should rebuke us. He should correct and chasten us in, in so many aspects of our lives. And, let, and yet he chooses to be merciful. And so there actually is nothing wrong with acting asking him for more mercy. He knows our frame. He knows our, our ways. He knows that we don't always do what we're, we're supposed to. And so, so asking him for mercy, especially in times like this, when, when so much of the world, I, I believe, is being rebuked, is being correct, is Amen. being chastened, mercy is what Christians really need. Amen. We deserve the righteous judgment of God. The whole world deserves the righteous judgment and rebuke of God Almighty. Yet he has chosen to be merciful unto us. Be merciful unto me, O God. I'm thankful for Psalms like uh, 118 and 136 where, where there's statements made and it's followed up with, For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever. And our God indeed, as much as he is eternal and much as he is, is, is all-powerful, lives forever, spans time and then beyond that. Uh, is, is not subject to the concept of time. Forever isn't even contained in God's understanding of where he abides. And yet his mercy endureth forever is the statement from our trans, our point of view where we would see God as, as, as far as we can even imagine from our little frame of existence. God's mercy stretches beyond that as much as his character stretches beyond that. You can go to Psalm 86. We see God's mercy here in Psalm 86 as a token. The whole psalm reads, Bow down thine ear, O God, and hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee, thee daily. It's interesting. He's holy, and yet he's still asking for the mercy of God. And that's the same position that we are as Bible believers, is that we've called upon the Lord, salvation's entered in. We are holy before him, and yet we need that mercy daily in order that as we abide in the flesh, we can still be preserved by the Almighty God that, that by all case and all points, he has the right to, to, to knock us down a peg and to, and to have more wrath put upon us. And yet, the cry that God asks for his mercy daily is a real one. And this is what David asks. Verse 4, it says, Rejoice the soul of thy servant. For unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. 
In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou, and th for thou wilt answer me. And that assurance is, is the same for us. Count on the fact that God has plentiful mercy, and in that day when you call upon him, he is ready to give mercy unto you. He is ready to answer you. Verse 8 says, Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto our works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and, art, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Amen. Amen. Verse 14, O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good, that they which hate me shall see it. Be ashamed, because thou, Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. That's what it, it's 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 coming to in these days and hours, I believe, is that that token for good is going to be clearly evidenced and seen upon those that are seeking God, that are lifting up their soul before God, that are constantly asking supplications, asking for His plenteous mercy to come upon them even more. They're, they're asking God, teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. I desire to walk in thy truth. Uh, unite my heart. Set my heart to always fear before thee, O God. And, and asking for that sweet token of good, that those which hate the Lord, those which hate God's people, would see it, would behold those things. And God's mercy as a token or as a visible sign to the world uh, that is on those that are saved, that are forgiven, it's there as evidence of the special place on God's heart where we abide. He loves us. He cares for us. He has mercy, um, unlimited, able to give to us if we would only ask Him and seek Him and be near Him and be close to Him and chase after the God of heaven. Then God would give that visible sign to the world that we are His chosen people. The reality is, is that we're often no better than the world. And as far as our works go, um, we... we we are in a position where our deeds sometimes are not as righteous as even what would be termed as the wicked, the unbelievers, the fool that has said in his heart there is no God. And so it must be quite the astonishing thing, and I believe it will be, uh, bring people to astonishment and fear. When they see somebody like myself, who's not the most righteous person, the most upright person, the most perfect person walking before God, given a token that God says, yes, he's my son. I will give mercy unto him. And that's where we see a thousand falling at thy right hand, and it shall not come nigh unto us. It's not because we're special or we're good or we're, we're deserving of these things. It's because God's mercy extended to us when Jesus died on that cross and we believed on his son for salvation. Amen. In that moment, he withholds what we deserve for our sins for his son's name's sake, not for my name's sake and my deeds, but because he loved the son and entered in, we entered into that same covenant that his son offered us. Now we can stand unashamed when the world must be ashamed for their faults, for their sins, for their wickednesses. Back in Psalm 56, he said, be merciful unto me, O God, for men would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppressed me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O oh, thou most high. And this true, this world would chew us up. It will eat us. It will devour the believers. More and more, as, as the times change and the, the belief structure changes and, and, the, and the, the, the government, perhaps, or more importantly, the media that's just pumping the living rooms full of their version of truth, they're going to turn the, the eyes and the hearts of the people against God's people. And we see that more and more. The, the oppression that comes from the media 
and from government bills that go through and from the advertisements and from the regulations. That oppression is seeking to devour God's people as it always has. And it's not just the mind that's being turned and evil afflicted against God's people, but it's also that there are physical issues that arise because of the oppression that comes. There are mockings, there are railings, there are words that are exchanged. There are physical confrontations that have gone on throughout centuries against God's people. And I believe because God sees it fit to put a token of his mercy upon believers, it's why the world hates them so much. It's because they're not, they're living a similar lifestyle and yet God sets them apart in his perfect will and perfect desire. David here says the world is constantly daily oppressing me. There's so many that are fighting against me, oh God. And there's so many ways that these people are fighting against us, the world. There's so many different people involved in the world that are fighting, made themselves enemies of God's people. Verse 3, it says, they are not afraid. That's what we see here. He says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. The reality is, is that they are afraid because they don't have the second part of this verse. What time I am afraid to the world is I will buy toilet paper. What time I am afraid, I will panic and buy out all of the groceries. Like what time I am afraid, I will lock myself in a cave until this all passes over. What time I am afraid as a believer, I will trust in God. It's the antidote for this. The world has their panic. The world has their grief. The world has their torments and their stresses. Across the page in Psalm 53 and verse 5, it says, There were they in great fear where no fear was. It's like in a moment where there was no fear of going to a public place. Now there's great fear. Where there was no fear in bumping into somebody on a, a pathway where you're walking and getting some exercise. Now there is great fear. Where there was no fear, now they are in great fear. Fear and it's come upon the world, and they don't have an antidote. They don't have the magical potion. They don't have any serum. I'm sure they're working on it, but the reality is, is that their fear will consume them because it's going to just run its course. And fear will be got. Fear will be got. Fear will be got. Fear until there's nothing left but just torments, because that's the end of all fears. Now, the aged in these scenarios, they'll pine away, they'll nag, they'll obsess. And maybe if you experience that, some people that have legitimate health concerns, when they go away, they tend to just reach out and, and act their fear by just kind of um, provoking other people to be as fearful as them. Um, you know, telling everybody that this stuff is real and you have to behave a certain way because you can infect and affect me. And, and that's kind of how the aged have reacted to it. The middle aged, well, they're going to fight. They're going to battle. They're going to try to get all of their P's and Q's lined up. They're going to they're gonna try to live another day. And it's an inward and it's an outward battle. The children, unfortunately, in times like these, they really have no hope but to suffer above uh, to all that are above them. We've seen this. We've seen this happening. The increase of abuse that has come to children who, who used to go out and they used to be in their classes at school and they used to have their, their events where it would give parents a break. Now parents who are, who are so bogged down with fear and stress and constantly having the media pumping into their minds of the same, they're now turning on their children because they had no patience to begin with, but they had a break before. And we're seeing increased numbers of children who are succumbing to violent acts from their loved ones. There's children abuse just, just running rampant. And so the panic, the grief, the torment all comes from the time that they are afraid and they don't have a solution for it. Now to us as believers, as fear increases, trust ought to increase. You gotta, you gotta balance that thing out. I'm starting to get afraid. I need to trust in God. And you know what that does? That brings down the level of fear. Because you're giving proper reverence to God. If, you, if you're seeking after God, you're admitting that He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He has this whole scenario and situation in His hands, and He can care for you. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. And more than ever, we need God to lead us in the paths of righteousness. We need God to lead us in the way that He would go, so that we can trust Him more. And trust him more and trust him more as he shows us. 
Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. And these great verses about trusting God, these great hymns about trusting God, need to be brought to our own remembrance constantly so that we're not fearing like the world does. Amen. Don't mourn like the world does. Don't fear like the world does. Don't react like the world does. Don't hide away like the world does. The world has their methods of coping with their sickness of fear. We don't need to behave that way. The world is in panic and grief and torment and taking out their sufferings on the, on the generations behind them that they have created and raised up. Look, the middle-aged people are panicking and buying stuff because the old folks raised them to be that way. The kids are, are, are cooped up and it's justified that they would be a little bit more ornery. They'd be a little bit more excitable. They would be a little bit different in behavior than they normally do. But when they're acting out to the point where the parents just lose their minds and take their fists to them, those parents raised that generation. You've created your own problems, and it's all encompassed and coming to fruition because of your great fear. And the world has fear, and the world has torments, and rightfully so. Because Why? Because they can't trust in a God that they don't believe in. Proverbs chapter 1 gives a comparison of this. Proverbs chapter 1. And keep your finger there in Psalm 56. In Proverbs chapter 1... Beginning in verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The Bible also says these same fools are such because they say that there is no God. They despise wisdom. They despise instruction. Even if you were to give them a proverb that would fit the scenario, the second they realize that it came from the Lord, it doesn't apply to them anymore. Verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. This is, the, this is the proper order of things being given as to how generations are created in righteousness. Fearing the Lord first is the beginning of all knowledge, and then talking to their sons of the instruction that God gives you and telling them to not forsake it. It, it trickles down generation after generation, beginning with the fear of the Lord. And if you do, verse 9 says, For they shall be an ornament of grace. What? The instructions. Of the, of the father and the instructions of the mother that fears God, they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. We need to make this constant dis conscious decision to fear him first, even though the world would reject this same type of knowledge because they are fools. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 24, the Bible says, Because I have called and you refuse. And look, it's not that God didn't reach out to people or call after all these fools that have rejected him. No, the Bible's clear. I have called and ye refused. Again, God says, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But this is what they did contrawise. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. And this is going to be the problem that we have too. If this is what I believe is just kind of a, an event, a trial run for what we see in Revelation 13 and the buildup of the tribulation. If this is just a trial run. This is God calling and they're refusing. This is God stretching out his hand and no man regarding the same. They rather, and we're, we're in danger of doing the same, have said it not his counsel, would not have his proofs. And you know what the end result will be? Verse 26. I will also, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. How many people do you think are sitting at home fearful? Now, after years of perhaps rejecting the call of God, rejecting his stretched out hand, rejecting his counsel and reproof, are now going, oh God, what am I going to do? I don't want to die from this. I don't want, I don't want to suffer this. I don't want my parents to go through this. Unfortunately, for those that have rejected it enough, God will laugh at your calamity and mock when your fear cometh. Look, our God is merciful and has mercy to the ends of the earth for those that have trusted him. Speedily, quickly, get on board with God's plan. Believe and trust in him. He has mercy abound to that person. 
who believes on him readily, as, as quickly as he hears the gospel. Stubborn, yes, perhaps a few more times and God gets to him. But finally, the, the mercy of God will last and endureth forever to that man, but the one that's rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. Proverbs chapter 1 here is another example of the reprobate doctrine we see in Romans chapter 1, and we see it through 1 Peter, Jude, and so on and so forth. God actually laughing at the fear and mocking it when it cometh upon those. When your fear cometh, verse 27, as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And that's a constant and conscious decision that we have to make as believers as well. Verse 30 says, They would none of my counsel. They despise all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. And, it, and that's interesting, isn't it? Your ways are what's created the trap that you're in. <laughs> your own way and your own fruit is what you're eating. You're stuck in your own devices. Verse 32, for the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But the contrast is here. And they've made their choice, and they've decided they want none of God's reproof. They want none of God's correction. They want none of God's instruction that I believe He is thundering from the heavens upon this world, even as we stand here today. And so their calamity will come, and they will be mocked in the same. But, verse 33, whoso hearkeneth to me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Amen. And that's a wonderful blessing to those that are just what? Hearkening unto God. It doesn't, it doesn't say here that you're doing everything that God expects from you. It doesn't say here you're some perfect and upright and morally purest of persons. You're a fine specimen of a believer. You're simply someone that's hearkening unto God. You're just, you're just listening to His words. You're just trying your best to do whatever He wants. That man shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of the evil. Make your choice about what reaction you would prefer from God. Have safety. Have, have quietness in this turmoil. Be not afraid of the evil that is surrounding us, the hurt and harm that is surrounding us. Or have him laughing when your calamity comes because you've rejected him so many times. Unfortunately, the, per, the vast majority of the world has chosen to fear evil instead of fearing God himself. Let's go back to Psalm 56. And the wise and understanding will choose after God's word and they will seek after that in times like this. Psalm 56 and verse 4 says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Trust in the word. Don't fear the flesh. Verse 5, it says, Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. And the promise was just made in the previous reading that we need not fear evil if we're putting our trust in and God. And so their thoughts may be against me for evil, but do I have any fear of that? No. Do I worry about the world that is just thinking evil and malicious things about me because I decided to keep the church doors open? Do I care about the people that, that are thinking evil thoughts against me because I have decided to go out into the public and preach the gospel to anyone I can find that would hear it? Should I be afraid of those things? No, I shouldn't fear these things at all because I will not fear what flesh can do unto me for I put the fear of God above all things. Here every day they're resting our words, okay? Every day they'll take even what I'm saying as I stand up here and they'll try to bend it and twist it and say, well, he's leading some sort of revolt or he's trying to be rebellious and he's, he's just anti-government and all these things. They can rest my words all day long, but it doesn't change the fact that I don't need to fear the evil that they're spitting at me. Look, when people have evil thoughts against you, no matter what you say, it's going to come off as evil. Haven't you ever had that in a conversation, a text message, and someone comes to you and they're like, look at this person, they're like yelling at me, and they're saying all these bad things, and like, look at their tone, and you read it, and you're just like, yeah, I don't see it. It's because you, you've, you've, in your mind, created a persona and applied a tone to a, 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 a string of text. And the same thing is true when people think evil thoughts about others and then they take your words and twist them. It's because they think evil about you, therefore all your words will appear to be evil in their sight. 
Psalm 120 and verse 7 says, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. <laughs> David was all about keeping peace in the kingdom. He was all about getting along with folks. He was all about going about to do right. He was a shepherd. He was a, he was a quiet guy, liked to spend his time out in the peaceful fields and you know just I, I picture David as, as as a musician like to be kind of alone playing his instruments of, of ten strings and just just kind of a, a calm dude for the most part but when he spoke there for war and it is in spite David's intentions the world hated him they thought evil against him because he was after God's own heart and therefore whatever he said they're like He's declaring war against us. Please, I, let's just have some peace in this situation. What did you say to me? The world comes at him and, and, and takes that as a threat for some reason. Because the world's mind is twisted against us as believers. Whatever we say, it's going to be harmful. So why, why do we want to go about and censor to appease the world? Why do we want to go about and, and soften the message and try to conform and try to compromise with what the world is saying? When no matter what we say, they're going to rest it into whatever they want it to be. And make us look bad why do we go then and trim the message it's not gonna matter anyway we'll be appeared as evil Christ when he was here came about doing good exclusively the Bible said and yet though he did good all the time sinned against nobody stepped on nobody's toes wronged nobody hurt nobody defamed nobody Christ was condemned to the cross as if he was some sort of sinner and troublemaker no matter what we do, the world will look at us as they feel like doing so. Why? Because they don't have God in their sight. They don't have God in their mind. They don't have God in their hearts before them. He's, he's of no interest um, unto them. They're, they're of no interest in the things of God. Verse 6 says, they gather themselves together. This verse is interesting. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. And that's interesting because whether whether or not, um, well, it, it almost seems like a contrast there. They're, they're gathering, but they're hiding. They're gathering, but they're, what, what does that mean? It, it's exactly what's happening today. <laughs> they're gathering themselves. The world is gathering. Do you know how they're doing it? Through their social media through their, uh, the, the news that's being broadcast, through, through the, 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 the statements that the government is making, which people are conforming and aligning with in perfection, whatever you want to do. They're gathering even though they're hiding themselves, even though they're hiding away, even though they're pining away, even though they're practicing their, their social distancing and whatnot. You know, and, and honestly, I'm not, not doing that. I, I've been separate from people. I've been doing the best I can to, to, to uphold all of those things. I just drew the line at, at the congregation and meeting as a church, but throughout the week, I only meet with my family. I talk to people from 10 feet away or whatever it takes. That's fine. But here we find that interesting perspective is that the world is gathering themselves together. Popular opinion is becoming the only accepted opinion. There is a united front of actions that are being carried out in the world, and at the same time, an inclusive of that is that they're hiding themselves. Now look at this. They mark my steps. I don't know if you've experienced this yet, but your steps are being marked. Now, if you go over to Britain, you're going to find CCTV on every corner. You're going to find HD cameras pointing at every single place. You can't go anywhere without being spotted by these closed caption televisions or whatever they're referred to as. Basically, you're always being recorded. But if we don't have that here, that doesn't mean our steps aren't being marked by those that are gathering themselves and hiding themselves. I just experienced it the other day. I walked up to the bike shop, me and Caleb and the bike guy were out talking about things. We were getting something work done. And then next thing you know, I drive away and the bylaw shows up. And bylaw showed up and said, we heard that you're having a gathering over here, okay? Your steps are being marked, okay? Somebody, some, some person that is perfectly in line gathered to that frame of mind, gathered to that popular opinion on that united front of actions that anybody gathering is automatically bad, they just called in and said, hey, we saw people gathering and the police came and they showed up and they decided to break up what wasn't even happening to begin with. That's how we see that our steps are being marked. And the next point is that they wait for your soul. Now, we don't have CCTV on every corner, like I said, but every corner has that nosy neighbor that's hidden away, gathered to the cause of being separate, gathering to the cause of self-quarantine, gathering to the cause of 
What are the other what are the other statements they're making? Flatten the curve. Gather to that 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 marching order to, to do. And like I said, I'm not fighting against these things. I think all of these things are fair in their place, okay? That's fine. But it's getting a little bit weird when three people can't stand on a front lawn without having the police called. It's getting a little bit weird when kids can't shoot hoops without having the hoops cut down. It's getting a little bit weird when there's when there's playgrounds that are all blocked off by caution tape. It's getting a little bit weird, a little bit intense, okay? Now, obviously the goal of the devil is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's gonna, he's gonna steal your uh, rights. He's going to kill your body. He's going to destroy every semblance of life that, that we have come to know. These are watching for the soul, and these are the ones that have gathered, they're hiding, they're marking our steps, and they're waiting for our soul, just as the devil would. Now our mind, our will, our emotions, that is what our soul is made up of. Everything that you are, that I can't put my hands on at this moment. Your, your, your consciousness, your thoughts, your, 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 your mind, that's what makes up your soul or your heart. And that is what's being watched for. That is what they want to steal. They want to kill and they want to destroy. Now, glory to God, they can't. Our soul is saved and preserved in Christ Jesus. But a man, they can make it rough where we're living today. And that would be a crying shame. Verse 7, it says, shall they escape by iniquity? Now, now and that's what they think. They think that, that, that in their iniquity, they can still escape from what's to come. Now, if this is a righteous judgment of God... You need to ditch your iniquity if you expect your nation to be saved. God judges nations in this earth and in this life because he can't judge them anywhere else. There is no nation that's going to go on into the next life. It's made up of individual people. And so if your nation is by and large wicked, you're not escaping by your iniquity. You're not escaping and bringing your iniquity with you. Now, in this same day where the earth is, all together united is mourning the death of 30,000 people that have died by this virus, supposedly, okay? In the day when they are mourning 30,000 deaths, in over two months, mind you, okay? In that same day, there were 14 million other causes of death. Just random. Falling, tripping, hurting, hunger, sickness, disease, old age. Just keep on listening. It, death has always been a thing, okay? It, it's not new in 2020. We didn't just discover death. But that just puts it in perspective. 30,000 deaths over two months and we're all up in arms, not even considering that 14 million people have died this year alone just from random other causes. That's 33,000 as of yesterday that died in one day. There are more people that died in one day from miscellaneous causes than died by that virus in two months, okay? Not to mention the fact that in that same day, yesterday being such, 24,000 abortions took place. And so, so 14, let's see, 33,000 people died by random causes not associated with the virus yesterday. It might, no, it's not clear. In the same day, People leave this earth, and there should have been about 24,000 other lives that entered into this earth. So we're at kind of a, an imbalance here. But again, nobody's mourning the random miscellaneous life circumstance deaths that happened. No one's mourning the 24,000 abortions that took place in one day. And yet the world thinks that they will be delivered. Shall they escape by their iniquity? Shall they, shall they continue on in the iniquity of killing innocent babies in the womb, and, and then just carry on with life as it is? Shall they escape by iniquity? Shall they, shall they be able to close up the church house and close up um, all these things they deem unfit that are needful for people, and then keep the liquor store open, keep the abortion mills running, keep, keep devouring our God-given rights for just average, decent people? Taking those things away, the freedom to travel, the freedom to assemble, the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, all those freedoms they want to just wipe out. Shall they escape and, and be imposing such iniquity on just everyday people? I'm not even talking about Christians at this moment. They're, they're taking away the freedoms from everybody while thinking that they can still have the liquor flowing, still have the abortions going forward, still have their iniquity. Bring it on with them. Shall they escape by it? The answer is no. 2 Peter 2, it says the judgment 
of now, of a long time, lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. God's anger is not just going to fall asleep, doze off, and forget about these things. He's not going to sleep on it for a moment. God's anger and wrath towards our nation and towards the world of nations at large is not going to slumber. It's not going to miss out. It's not going to fall asleep and get careless on this. It lingereth not and it slumbereth not. Their damnation, their judgment is coming and it will come in due time. And that's why we as God's people need God's mercy because Unfortunately or fortunately for us, however you look at it, our nation is heavenly Jerusalem. It's not here yet, so we have to abide as strangers, even as Abraham dwelled in tent in the land that was promised to him. We need to dwell as tent people, not knowing whether we're coming or going in this life. We're just following after God, looking for our nation in heaven, abiding in nations that are under the wrath of God. We need his mercy at these times. Verse 8 says, Thou tellest... My wonders. And that's a good point there. God's counting. He's making note. He's marking my wanderings. And sometimes, and even yesterday we kind of experienced this, our, our leisurely, aimless travels from place to place to place. God tell us. God's counting. God's keeping note of our wanderings. I like that because that means God's in control of things. Even when I'm just going about my bike and I don't really know where I'm going, even when we're just walking around in parks trying to meet people to talk to, God is aware of where I'm at. And God is watching where I'm at. He's taking count of and note of and marking my wanderings about in this life as I look for ultimately heavenly Jerusalem, my, my ultimate home. And this whole life is nothing but a wandering. It's nothing but a but uh, just, just, just journey. We don't really know where we're going. We're, we're aimless often. Our travels are just from place to place, kind of willy-nilly in the grand scheme of things. And yet God takes these things seriously because he's counting them, noting them, marking them. He's telling all of our wanderings. The prayer here, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Bottled tears kept preserved. I think God answered that prayer. Meaning that he knows them. He knows, he knows where we were at, what happened. He, he's kept all of our tears in store. What he needs them for, I don't know. But then he says this, are they not in thy book? Are they not in thy book? And, and I don't know how many pages I have in here. Well, you'll just find kind of a, a wrinkly circle. I think that's what David's saying, you know. Lord, would you keep my tears in a bottle? They're already in thy book. They're already on the pages of your word as you spoke to me. I'm trusting in you. What time I fear, I will trust in thee, Lord. I need to trust in thy word. In God, I will praise his word. In God, have I put my trust above all things. I can't fear what flesh shall do unto me because God above all things is in control of these things. He's marking my past. He's watching my wanderings. He's always got his eyes upon me to the point where he is able to bottle and keep every tear that I've ever cried. See them marking the pages of his word as I read through it. Verse 9 says, When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Now crying unto God here in, in, spite of this, in, in light of this verse is the key. When you cry unto God, when I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. Okay, and, and you know what? Yesterday we prayed that the authorities would stay away, that our enemies would turn away, that we would just be left alone. We even prayed that we would bump into somebody that needed to hear the, the gospel, and glory to God, that happened. We walked up to a man that literally said, I'm afraid. I'm so afraid of this thing. I'm so fearful of this thing. Why aren't the churches open? Why can't I go find anybody? Why can't I get after God? And we, we gave him the gospel, and he believed the gospel. And the light went on when he said, you know, he's like, yeah, I think God would, I think God would take away my salvation if I did something really bad. And I said, but what if, but, and, I, and I brought him back around. And then eventually when I said it to him, I'm like, it's a gift. And could he ever take it away? And he was just like, dang, no, it's eternal. He, he his own words confessed he believed on eternal life in Jesus Christ without me provoking and prodding and trying to fill his words with things to prayer. He needed God's word and couldn't find it. And God gave us exactly what we needed in order to be safe and to be in that scenario. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. And we didn't face any enemies that whole day. This I know. Why? For God is for me. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Not puffing my chest, but come on, world, be against us. God's for us. Try it. 
Who can be against us? The world, the, 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 the police. And I'm not picking on governments, but there's, there's, there's real situations that are happening where the world is coming against God's people. Try it. If God be for us, who can be against us? You're not even, you're not even counted a blip. You try to be against us. Well, you can't be because the word of God says so. Why? I know this. I know that when I cry unto him that my enemies shall turn back. They shall flee. They shall go another way. They shall leave me alone. And this I know why. Because God is for me. And I have to believe that and trust that. Be against us, world. Who cares? God is for us. Who can be against us? They will try. They will determined to they will make efforts to but in the end they will always wear out and they will always turn back god is for us verse 10 and god will i praise his word and the lord will i praise his word we need to abide in god we need to praise his words we need to recognize as we often tell people when they get saved that hey you want to hear from god open this thing that's why you should praise this thing. That's why you should grab that King James Bible if you speak English. And you should love this thing. You should cry teardrops onto this thing. You should hug this thing. There's nothing wrong with that because that's your connection with the loving, living God of all. John 15 verse 7 says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. And that promise is that you abide in God and his words abide in you. That, that's likening them to the same thing. If you're going to live in God, if you're to walk in God and in his ways, you have to be in his word. His word is your connection. It is your lifeblood. It is the, it is the um, what's the word? It, it's the scarlet cord that was let down. It's, it's, it's your connection to the Father, it's your connection to the Son, it's your connection to the Spirit that is within you, because without the words entering in, He has nothing to bring to your remembrance. What more cause of praise can you have that when you ask God, you receive exactly what you ask for? Asking it according to His will, asking whatever you will. God is there ready to give you what you want or even something better. What more can you find to praise that you can go to the God of all and ask petitions of him? Even as we did yesterday. It seems to be such a small thing, but we asked for no authorities and they didn't show. We asked to be led to a soul and there he was, ready and fearful of what flesh could do unto him. And so we showed him, you don't need to fear what flesh can do unto you. You need to trust the word of God because you're going to die Today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, whatever, and it may be from coronavirus, it may not be. Regardless, death is after you, but you can overcome death. Don't fear, man. Don't fear death. Don't fear suffering. Don't fear sickness. Don't fear disease. Fear God above all things. Amen. Verse 11, it says, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. We can't be fearing God. Um, man above God. we got to put God first. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. You want to be trapped? You want to be tripped? You want to be caught? You want to be stuck? You want to be helpless? Fear men. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Safety is of the Lord. Yes, the horse is prepared into the day of battle, but safety is of my God. Safety is of the Lord. So put your fear into man if you want to be trapped, if you want to be tripped, if you want to be tricked, if you want to be deceived in this life, and maybe even the next, okay? But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The world keeps saying, be safe, be safe, be safe. It's another one of those, one of those mantras you keep hearing. Be safe, I will fear the Lord. <laughs> be safe, I will fear the Lord. How are you going to be safe, world? That's why they have to keep saying it, because it makes them think that they are by sheltering it. It makes them think that they are by staying six feet by six feet by six by six by six, six, six feet away from everybody. It makes them feel comfort like they're safe, but they're not safe because death is coming for them. And if they're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, they are not safe. They are not saved. And the, 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 the torments of hell await for them. And they finally leave this life, whether by corona or by whatever. Verse 12, thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praise 
unto thee. What are the vows of God? Well, when he says things like, you know, I will care for you, I love you. He says, verily there is a roar for the righteous. When he says things like, um, I am the Lord, I change not. His vows are his promises to you. Don't be afraid. Don't fear what man can do unto you. A thousand shall fall at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Those are the vows of God, and they are upon us. What a blessing to have the blessed promises of Scripture. Again, they ought to bring us more praise. We ought to rehearse these things often. We ought to remind ourselves that if God be for us, who can be against us? We ought to remind ourselves that death hath no sting upon us. We ought to remind ourselves that God is in control. He is at the helm. He is the one that's going to break out the teeth of the enemy. We don't need to fear. We need to remind ourselves rather of the vows that God put upon his own people. Render praise unto him for the same. God loves being praised for the things that he does and his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 13 the Bible reads, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. And isn't that true? Death hath no dominion. Death hath no torments. Death hath no sting upon the believer. I realize that saying that, 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 that the Bible records one day we will, we will say, Hey, death, where is thy sting? And at the same time, in the time of tribulation, when those locusts from hell come out, you know what the world's going to be saying? Oh, sting, where is thy death? They shall desire to die, but death shall flee from them. We've been delivered. Our soul is free from death, free from sin. We are alive, alive, alive forevermore in Christ because we believed on the Son to give us salvation. We're delivered from death, and that's what it says. Thou hast delivered my soul from death. And here's another plea for the mercy of God. You've delivered my soul from death, Lord. I know that when I die, I will be in heaven, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and I'll stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb at that time. Next point, it says, Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling? Okay, I've been saved. I'm born again. I'm going to heaven. But Lord, would you not deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? And that's what I desire now more than anything. Okay? I'm hoping and praying that my life can go back to some sense of normalcy. With the lessons that I've learned, with, with the wisdom that I've gained, with, with the insights into how the world is going to change in a moment and become against God's people, with that knowledge, I hope and pray to God that he would deliver my feet from falling at this time. That he would allow me to walk before him in the light of the living, in the land of the living, I could continue to preach the word. I could continue to go door to door soul winning. Remember going places? That was awesome. That's another me myself. Remember going places? Went to God that, yes, he saved us from death. Yes, he saved us from hell. He saved us from our sin. But, oh God, will you keep my feet from falling at such a time as this? Oh God, will you allow me a little space of grace, some mercy to, to not have this take over my family. I not have this world take over my church. And I have this world take over my family members, my loved ones, my co-workers, in order that I could reevaluate and learn lessons from what has happened and continue to walk before God in the land of the living. Give us some more time, God. Give us some more mercy, God. Give us some more of your extended grace in order that we could learn and do great works in a world that would be more receptive to your truth. We could continue going here, there, and everywhere on mission trips. We could go, we could preach the word to the lost freely. We could have meetings. We could go to meetings. We could enjoy the fellowship without the fear of some invisible disease again, without the fear of the authorities cracking down on us. Would to God you would give us that opportunity again to not fall by this scenario, to not fall by this situation, to not be tripped up and snared in fear first, but then the actual uh, presence of men, the actual oppression of men. But God, would you allow us in your mercy to walk before you again in this land of the living? What a, what a great thing that would be if God would just spare his 
wrath a little bit longer. And would just hold off the coming of that wicked one. He would just hold off the falling away just long enough for us to have a few more weeks, a few more months, a few more years to live before him in the light of the living Amen. and show forth his truth and bring it to people, showing them that you don't need to fear. Look at the world made you so afraid that you have 600 rolls of toilet paper in your basement. What are you doing? Don't fear what flesh can do unto you. Fear God who has control of all these things and even holds your breath in his hand. That could be extinguished in a moment. Thank you, Father.